This is a session on coaching through games. We're going to be looking at the structure of the actual training session, how we engage players, how we replicate or take a picture, how we can make decision makers. The games have to be related in some way, but they don't have to be necessarily specific to rugby. And hopefully I'm going to show you guys a few games tonight that you'll think, well, they're passing the ball forwards for a start. That's not related to rugby. Well, no, but it's another way to get them thinking about attacking space or evasion, for instance. What we want to try and do is start with, like I say, some pretty less challenging games and then finish with more challenging that we can condition where there's progressions within that game itself, as opposed to it being a really hard game and then we become really frustrated as coaches because they can't get the game. It's got to be something that they can just pick up and go with to engage them and to get them active early. Within a training session, just from our point of view as coaches, we'd be looking at you obviously pulling the coaches, uh, the players in, introducing the session. So there what we're looking at you doing is introducing the session such as, OK, tonight, guys, we're going to do a handling session and then giving them two to three key points for handling and that's it. So you can't look at everything. You can't say, OK, well, here's handling and here's the checklist of ten different points because that's just overwhelming. After point three, they've, they've lost it, they've switched off. So we're giving them two to three key points, and at this point, we're trying to pull the information from them as well. So we might say, OK, one thing we're going to look at tonight is getting our hands up to catch the ball, maybe then engaging the players. How, how could we engage the players at that point? Get them in the circle and start passing the ball. OK, yeah, yeah, so to pull them in. How can we pull the information from them? Yeah, so we're asking the question. So we've got our hands up. Why do we have to have our hands up to pass the to catch a ball? You know, and when we're working with junior players, it's making them understand. Rather than saying we have to have our hands up to catch the ball, you have to justify that. So think about that with your coaching. So all of a sudden, two key points to three is enough information for a young player to take on board. So when we're playing the games at the start, the key thing to remember is to maximise the amount of activity that the, um, the maximum number of participants can be doing at one time. Does that make sense? So rather than having a game where, you know, you see maybe one player having a go and there's 25 other players waiting for their turn, how can we engage all 25 players? So quite a nice little thing to do is when we are coaching through games is to have two games running at the same time. So when you are working with junior players, sometimes that's hard because you're not able to referee it. When we are coaching through games, there has to be a purpose and there has to be rules. Kids actually prefer there to be rules and for us to stick to them so that they see the value and the point of the game itself as opposed to it just being a free-for-all. So think about how you can maximise as many kids playing as possible at the same time and how quickly you can get them into a game. So within the start of a session, the kids should be active within two or three minutes. So that means we have to be really organised to get them into a game with pinnies, with cones set out, with the playing areas ready to go and the boundaries clearly marked out. So when we're introducing games to players, it's really important that they fully understand the rules first. That will save you a lot of time later on. So it's explaining the rules and then doing a demonstration. So say you've got four teams playing, two games going at the same time, take two of the teams, let them have a go, even if it's just walking through, how can we check they know what we're asking them to do? Ask them. Perfect, yeah. Ask them questions. So how do we score in this? 
OK, well, you put the ball down in that circle. Brilliant. OK, what direction can we pass? So it's just reinforcing it all the time so that you don't start the game and then have to stop it because one or two didn't understand it. And some of these games can be quite creative and quite complicated. So, you know, it's making sure that they, they know what's going on. So what we're going to look at now is maybe a couple of warm-up games. Some of these are obviously tailored for younger kids, some are tailored for older kids, but what I'd say is that I play these games with my senior Premier men's team and when I'm coaching at U7, U9 level. So the games can be applicable for any age group, you just maybe vary them slightly. The first game that we're going to look at is called Sharks and Fishes. So as I say, when we, when we set up a game, it's really important that we have cones out and they clearly know their boundaries. So in this game, this is a game just basically to get them straight into it. It's a warm-up game. It's not very challenging, but the kids, the younger kids really enjoy this game. All it is, this is testing their evasion skills. So you have an area here, it might be 20 meters by kind of 20 meters. All the fishes are the rugby players, okay, they're the kids, and they all have a ball each, and the sharks are here. Okay, so when you shout go, all they have to do, the fishes have to get across to the other side without getting caught. Okay, so a similar game to this is British Bulldogs, all right? If a fish gets caught, they then become a shark. So on the coach's command, you shout go, they go to this side, one or two get caught, come back, and you keep going. So the idea is, is that the sharks tag the fishes and then they become the sharks. So what we're looking at here, we can actually look at a lot more than what, what it might appear. Um, with, the, with the fishes, we're teaching them to carry the ball in two hands and then they might move the ball over to one hand based on where the shark's coming from, which is in the game, where the defender's coming from. So we're teaching them to run with the ball in their hand, we're teaching them to move and be evasive. With the sharks, when we get more than two or three, what we're actually thinking about now is defensive principles of coming up as a line together. So rather than one going this way, one going that way, and one kind of doing that, hopefully the players will work it out well, actually, if we all stand here and we all come up at the same speed and we all come forwards together, we might form a defensive line. So hopefully that's, that's the kind of way that we can introduce that pretty quickly into a game without it being too complicated. So there's a warm-up game. Let them play it, just let them have a go, and then you might call them in and say, OK, so sharks, how can you work more effectively together? Well, if we kind of come up together and... OK, brilliant, so let's try and keep a, a bit of a defensive line here, but let them have a go. There's nothing worse than having a go and then the coach stopping. This is just a game just to let them see, and often they'll do it without realising they're doing it as well, without realising, oh, we're coming up as a defensive line here or I'm having a go at running. It's just run as fast as you can in attack, come up together in defence. So, again, you can do this with older guys or, or, or girls, you know, it's not, you know, you don't need to name it sharks and fishes, but it works quite well. And saying things to the younger players, like you're in a fish tank, Trust me, I, that's worked at school quite a lot because then they go outside the cones, you're like, no, you've got to stay in the tank. You know, and just being a little bit more animated with them. This one is pretty simple. Okay, you've got all the players in here. Okay, so we'll just put them as P's. Okay, and they're just running around in a grid. This might be, say, 15 metres by 15 metres. And basically, you've got, say, two tiggers, but they've got a ball in their hand, and they've just got to go around and tig people. If you get tigged, if you get tagged, you become a tagger as well. 
and then you just join in. And all we're trying to do here is get the heart rate up and get them warmed up with the ball in hand. Only play this for like one or two minutes at a time because the novelty pretty quickly wears off. Um, however, the, you, really can, you really can progress this game quite well. So there's different versions. Um, you can play tunnel tag. Which is, if a player gets tagged with the ball, they have to stand like this, and then someone has to crawl through their legs and free them, and then they carry on. You can play a game, if you're um, doing a little bit more contact, if they get tagged, they have to stand like this, and then to free them, somebody has to leapfrog over them. So remember what we used to do in the playground? OK, so we're just trying to get them to do the different movements. It might be if they get tagged, they have to go down to the ground and present the ball. They may have a ball themselves in, as, the, as the players. So there's loads of different versions of that. And again, for a couple of minutes, it's getting them to use the space, it's getting them to move around, and as well, it's getting them to do a bit of communication. So a way that you can do this is if you've just if you've been tagged and you're here, somebody's freeing you, you can't then be tagged. You know, you give them a little bit of space. Another development on this is where um, you've got um, the taggers. Once a player gets tagged, they have to make a chain. So the people that are tagging makes a chain and then they have to run around. So you've got a couple of them tagging the players. Once they get caught, they make a chain. And so we're working on communication and we're actually working on playing together and the concept of being together in defence as opposed to just going off and randomly doing it. The other version of this that we can do is um, the taggers um, have a ball. OK, so you might give, you might have four taggers and say six to eight players in, in the grid. They've got a ball, they've got to pass the ball around, but they can't run when they've got the ball in their hand. So they've got to pass the ball and we've got to try and corner a player and then tag them with the ball. Then they become a defender as well. So again, little games as a warm up, you know, there's, there's quite a, a few different versions of that. And you can make it harder or easier by varying the size of the grid. So you wouldn't want to play this in a big area like half of the 22. So 15 by 15 is actually quite a big area to play this. So then you might make it smaller to make it easier for the people that are tagging. Harder for the players to kind of move out and move around. So loads of different versions again. You can do that with kind of U7s and U19s will like this as well just for a couple of minutes, it just gets them active and gets them warm straight into the game. These are your warm-up kind of games. So if you were doing a session on handling, anything in attack basically, they're pretty good little warm-up games. However, what I want us to look at now is a few more ball-related games. So looking at bringing the ball in. So when we are doing these games, it's really important that 99% of the time there are balls involved and that there's enough balls for, the, for us to play with. Just while we're talking about that, just having a look at different options. So playing these games with a tennis ball is pretty good. So that really gets them focusing they have to really concentrate and they have to keep their eyes on the ball when they're catching. If you try and catch a tennis ball like this, it's going to go straight through or you might catch it with one hand. So tennis balls are really, really good to use when you're coaching and when you're doing handling. Obviously, when you're coaching kids, you'll be using a size four ball, which is pretty important that you use a smaller ball with the younger age group. Um, and as well, I do quite a lot with the soccer ball. Again, it's just a different shape. It just gets them thinking about how they've got to handle the ball, you know, and it's a little bit of a novelty thing as well. So all of a sudden, these games that we're just about to talk about, if you do them with a tennis ball, a soccer ball and a rugby ball, you're starting to challenge the players all the time and just get them to kind of think a little bit differently about maybe how they're going to catch that ball. Um, you know, and the hand positioning.
So another little game. Kids kind of like this one because they get to steal things from each other. So we have a grid and we have about 12 rugby balls in the middle of the grid. Then you mark out a little nest on each corner. So you have four nests. And in a team, you'd have four players per team. So again, this is one that you would probably want to set up a couple of uh, different ones. The idea is the coach would blow the whistle or shout go. Players, only one player at a time can leave the nest. So players have got to leave the nest, pick up a ball, and once all the balls are gone from the middle, the players can then start to steal from each other's nests and they can't stop them. The rest of the players have got to stay inside, but they obviously take it in turns to have a go and go and steal the ball from each other. So the idea is, is that you say, right, we're going to play it for two minutes. When I blow the whistle after two minutes, whoever's got the most balls in their nest wins. And it's just, it's just a fun little game that the younger ones particularly would enjoy doing, probably up to about U11. They enjoy this. It's just an opportunity, a bit of competition. And that's the big thing about games, is that they want to have competition. They want to beat the other team. And so the most you do this is, say, three times within a training session. You know, within, you go, OK, right, we'll do this three times each two minutes, and then whoever's got the most after those three times. So rob the nest. And this is about. 15 meters, so the idea here is it's ball familiarization as well. So again, relating that back, you could have some tennis balls in the middle, a soccer ball and rugby balls, and you could give points to different balls. So if you get three tennis balls, that's five points for each ball or one point for a soccer ball and, you know, just playing around with it. So they're all the kind of basic sort of hand-eye coordination fundamentals to kind of some warm-up games. What I want to show now is kind of a little bit more rugby specific. Um, so with this one, this is a game that we're just trying to get them to work on passing the ball and moving the ball around. And this is more about your handling, being evasive, running, and creating a little bit of chaos as well. So all we've got, we've got one team against the other. So we'll just call it A versus B. OK, and they can be any way they want um, within the grid. OK, and again, this might be about 15 by 15 meters. All they have to do to start off with, they can run around in any direction and they can pass in any direction. They've just got to get five passes. Every time their team gets five passes successfully, they get a point. So again, it's really good to let them play for two minutes. Always try and time how long they're playing for because you kind of can get carried away as a coach as well. I know myself, I give my players one minute for a water break. It ends up about 15 seconds if they're lucky because I lose track of time. So keep an eye on the time. So the idea of this game, they can pass in any direction. And to start off with, they can run with the ball because it's easier to do it that way. OK, a big key point here is to put them in pinnies. Whenever you're playing a game, they must be able to recognize who their teammates are. So never play a game where we just say, all right, light colors and you're in a green shirt. You, you know, you must have, it must be easy for them to differentiate who their teammates are. So first of all, we can play a five pass game. The rules are you can pass in any direction. If you drop the ball, the other team gets the ball. The other team can get the ball back by intercepting the ball. If this is a player, I can't stand right, right next to them and kind of block them or anything. I've got to give them a meter, give them the space. So that's a real simple game. Five passes without dropping the ball, you get a point. You know, so it's the first of five points or you play for two minutes. Here, the coaching concepts, the coaching things that we're looking at is the hand grip on the ball. So when they catch the ball, we want the players to be holding the ball around the middle. 
Okay, so what we can start to talk to that and introduce them. And what we'll get here is a lot of overhand passes. So we condition it. It's got to be underhand. We've got to have two hands on the ball. So that's for the pass. When we catch the ball, we're talking to them about fingertips kind of pointing up to the sky. A good one to remember is to make a W for a winner. So thumbs together, fingertips up, trying to catch the ball. So they make the passes. Um, if they drop it, like I say, or the defense gets it, it's a turnover. So progressions of this is that you can now stop them from running. So within, you can catch the ball within five steps, you've got to have passed it. So that's one progression. Another progression is when they catch the ball, every time they catch the ball, they're not allowed to run now. They catch the ball, you're not allowed to run with the ball in your hand. You've got to tap it on the ground and then pass the ball. By getting them to tap it on the ground, that's introducing them to the idea of scoring and then looking up and moving the ball around. So again, that can be a progression. And then we can look at doing things like, so if one player, if player A passes to me, I can't pass back to him, I've got to pass to somebody else. So we're not just passing between the two of us. Another progression is once I've passed the ball, I've got to run outside of the grid, touch the ground, and then get back into the game. And by doing that, we're trying to manipulate the fact that we're getting everyone involved. We're creating a little bit more, a little bit more space and we're trying to get them used to kind of not just standing there and waiting for the ball. So that's called five pass game or tap and pass, however you, know, however you want to play it. Really, really good one to play for about three minutes. Stop, add a little progression, come back into it. So maybe repeat it a couple of times. You know, it's, it's a good warm up one. Get a ball in there straight away. And again, you can do it with a tennis ball, a soccer ball, or a rugby ball, just to kind of challenge them and um, make them kind of think about how they're going to catch and how they're going to pass. We're trying to get A, so if Bs have got the ball, we're trying to get the A's to defend a B, so to mark up. So if I was saying to the Bs, I'd say, right, go and get an A and don't let him or her get the ball. Mark them so they can't get it. So with the A's, we're saying, right, get free, get open, get into space. And they're the kind of, that's the kind of terminology that we're, we're using with them. It's like, get around and beat your opponent and, you know, try and get into space and get open. Um, so they're trying to intercept it. So what it actually t happens is, you know, there'll be quite a few drop balls and it's just an immediate turnover. We don't need to stop the game, we just keep the game going. Um, I bring in tap and pass pretty early. So the catch, you've got to tap it on the ground and pass. It just gets them moving around and dodging and thinking about what they're doing rather than, a, again, a drill where they're just running backwards and forwards or side to side. And you can have three of these games going, four at the same time. You know, a good number for this is about 8v8. If it goes above eight players, a lot of the time, you know, a few players will be standing out there chatting and stuff. So think about what we said about maximizing the amount of players that we've got in as short a space of time as possible. I've only ever done this with one ball, but you could bring in a couple of balls, but then you have two mini games going on, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. The next game I want to show you guys is end ball. There's absolutely loads of stuff you can do with this. So end ball, you might play, you'd play over a slightly larger area. So uh, it might be, say, for instance, depending on your numbers, you'd maybe play about 10 v 10 again. You can play 8v8 or 12, but any more than 10v10, you, you almost want to split up into two games again. So the idea is, is that basically one team, so you might play that tap and pass game and move into this game. This is quite a nice progression because this time what we have to do, you have your A's and your B's kind of wherever. Um, One team, basically, this is your scoring zone. OK, all they have to do, A's have to get the ball up here and score. So you can start it, they can pass in any direction, but they can't run with the ball. So you can start it off, the pass in any direction to score, particularly with the younger ones, we're introducing them to score in a try. How many times, how many drills, how many games do you have 
mainly drills, where you may do a 2v1 and they don't score the try. So what we're trying to do is encourage them to enjoy scoring and to actually be successful when they score. So the first part of it, you can't run with the ball, but you can pass in any direction, the same principle as what we've just played with before, and you can score anywhere on that try line. And you score by putting the ball down, but you can't run the ball in. You must pass to another teammate to score. So what we're trying to do here is look at different types of passing, basically, looking at a variety of different passes, um, but we're trying to condition it to rugby-specific passes, so underhand, so we don't want any kind of football passes. All underhand, we're trying to catch with two hands, we're trying to pass with two hands. This game also looks at spatial awareness. So by spatial awareness, what we mean is the player's ability to attack the space. That's what we're trying to get them to do in rugby. So they pass the ball, so a progression can be again where they're running with the ball and then they pass, you know, to get a turnover. So for the Bs to get the ball, if A's drop it, Bs get the ball. If, however, you can play a game where A's, if you get a two-handed touch by a B, you must pass the ball straight away progress it on to if you get touched three times before you score, if your team gets touched three times, the other team gets the ball. And as you get better, you might want to then take that down to a one touch. So you get one touch, right, the other team. So they're really having to think about passing the ball before contact as opposed to just running as far as they can and wait until they get tackled. We're trying to get them to move the ball into space. Again, though, we always make it so that they can't just run the ball in. We're trying to promote them getting their teammates around the ball. So another option is that you can only score if you've got two of your teammates in the end zone, in the scoring zone. So I might pass it here, but she can't put it down until another two. So we don't just have players kind of hanging around. Again, in defence, we're promoting these players, so Bs, to be marking up with an A and constantly on the move. Players really enjoy this because it's quite hard work and it gets them all involved and they're competitive. Another progression you can make is that if A's score, they just get to turn around and attack this way this time, so it keeps it going all the time. Or you may have it that if they score, they put the ball down, then Bs have a go the other way. Another progression is that if you, if you touch the first touch, you have to pass the ball backwards. So the first touch out of the sequence of three, all of the touches you can pass forwards. So there's, again, lots of different things you can do with that. Um, a key, a, a good thing to do as well here, I'm just gonna take the kind of A's and B's out. So it's the same game. But you may have different areas that they can score in. So for instance, you may just have two circles or two or three and number them one, two or three. So here we're trying to get the players to challenge themselves to think about changing direction, attacking the space, as well as be able to re respond and react quite quickly. So A's might be going this way, B's are going this way. So you let them play. And then when the coach shouts out a number, you might shout out three. Whoever's got the ball, you've got to try and get the ball into that circle, but nobody can be there waiting. It's got to be a pass into the circle. So we're just looking at trying to challenge them all the time. So just as they're getting comfortable with that, put a couple of circles in and say, okay, we're going to mix it up this time. You've got to try and get the ball into these circles to score and then they just continue playing. As they get good, as I've said, it might be that if they get tackled, if they get touched, it's a turnover straight away. And that's quite good with, you, with your older players as they progress, but I would always start with progressing it and if you get three touches, then it's a turnover rather than one touch. It's, it's quite difficult to do. We're going to look at touch rugby in a minute, but when we play an end ball, the other, the other thing that we can do is change the point of attack in terms of which way they're going. So you might shout, okay, we're going, when I call one, 
we're just scoring here. When I call two, we just turn it round and you're attacking this way. So that's um, narrower and longer, obviously shorter and wider, so hopefully we're encouraging the variety of passing and just trying them to get them to attack wide and kind of through the space and try and manipulate the space as well. We're going to have a look at a game now called Breakout Touch. So this is, this is to encourage them to, again, attack the space ball in hand and 1v1, over 70% of rugby is about a 1v1 challenge. Yet how many times do we do 1v1 in training? Or if we do, how many times do you see a line of 20 children and two children go in 1v1? So just looking at the part bit, and we'll come to this in later weeks, rather than setting up one bit, so the part of the session, rather than setting up one practice, one drill, can we have six or seven of them where the kids are working in groups of two or three and they're all having a go rather than having two long lines? So this is about, um, this is called breakout. And this is about the 1v1 challenge that sometimes as coaches we're scared to do because it's a bit competitive and there is a winner or there is a loser in 1v1, but hey, that's rugby, okay? <laughs> so. Here, we have a 20 metre grid set out on the outside and a 5 metre grid on the inside. We have four defenders. The defenders cannot go in the middle grid. They have to stay on the outside of the grid. And we have four attackers. Each of the attackers has a rugby ball to start off with. All the attackers have to do is try and score by getting to this outside line, to one of these outside lines. So the defenders, they can move sideways, backwards and forwards within this area, but they can't come in here. So as an attacker, they're trying to get to this line here to score, or to that line, whichever line of the square. So here what we're trying to do is find where the space is, isolate a defender, and then get out of the grid. The defender, if the defender catches the attacker and a two-handed touch, the attacker has to come back in and start again and attack a different line. They can't go to the same line twice. So what we're trying to do here is get the defenders to be able to read which way the attackers are going and for the attackers to really attack at pace and trying to score. So they go to one line, they get touched, okay, well, he or she has to turn around and try and attack this line. So what we're trying to also do is engage the defenders to maybe work together. So as he comes out here, we maybe try and get the defenders to pinch in, work together. However, that point, so if we've now got a defender here and a defender here, I would hope that one attacker might see the space and exploit it. So it's quite a nice little competitive game. Again, you can set up several of these games. A way to progress this is that you actually take away a couple of the balls. So you have one or two balls within the attack. So all of a sudden now, they have to pass the ball and they might work as a two, they might work as a three, and one might go off on her own or his own. So they can attack a line together. So it might be that this player here with the ball runs out and then they can pass to this player who's coming through to score. So they can go, like I say, on their own, or they can go with two, or they can go with three players. So you have two balls in the middle, and then you might take it to one ball. So now the defence are really having to work together to make sure they stop the, the two attackers, and they can try and work on the offload. But the biggest principle of this is that we're trying to attack the space as fast as we can. A little term to use, perhaps, is attack the space, not the face. So here it's all about trying to beat the defender and get around him or her to score a try. When you're playing these games, it's really important that 
everybody has an opportunity to score. So with the end ball game, just coming back to that, it might be that you say everyone in your team has got to touch the ball before we score or everybody has got to score within the two minutes we've allocated for this game. So all of a sudden, the little quiet one who sort of stood out on the wing or on the corner, now he's in the game and we're involving them. So we're really trying to encourage the fact that anybody can score at any point and it's about involving and using your teammates. Have you guys seen this game before? Once or twice, but you don't see it a lot. Yeah. It's because it's, it's quite, it's more set up than yeah. Yeah. Keeping the kids engaged. Yeah, totally. So just with that, when you're coaching through games, that brings up a really good point. You have to be organised, and a lot of the time you might not have much room, and that's the reality of it. And it's hard work for the coaches. It's harder to coach through games than it is a drill, because you can set the drill up and you can have confidence. When you coach through a game. It's unknown because you don't know whether they're going to succeed or, or fail at it ultimately, whether they'll enjoy it or not. But hopefully the, their enjoyment and their actual learning of what they're able to apply in a game. So effectively, this is a 2v1 drill. So rather than setting up, so that effectively is about trying to create, the, attack the space. So we're engaging eight people at one time in here, whereas if you do your traditional 2v1, so you've got, say, players all lined up here and you shout go, one player comes round here, two players come round here, we're working with three people at one time as opposed to trying to... Now, there is a time to do that because that means you can coach and correct faults doing this, but think about what we said at the start of trying to take a picture of that game how we can actually put that into a smaller game where they can pass the ball forwards or backwards or sideways it doesn't matter it's that one concept of we want them to beat a defender that we're trying to get out of that game and we just stick to that one concept other things will go wrong but that doesn't matter because that's what we're looking at tonight so i'm just going to finish now with a couple of variations of touch rugby because I'm sure people have got different, different thoughts on this. Touch rugby um, can be your own biggest enemy. It can also help a team to be very successful at attacking space, offloading and handling and working on defensive principles if it's coached right. What isn't so great is when at the start of a session, the coaches just say, okay, split yourselves up into two teams and have a quick game in touch while they go and set up desperately and try and get everything organised. Because inevitably, it'll be one pass, take it in, through the legs really slow, the defence will be offside. So it's really got to have a purpose because otherwise it can actually be quite detrimental to what you're trying to coach. It, it you know, forces bad habits. However, played within certain conditions, generally players enjoy it because it's competitive and it's pretty much as close to the game as you can get in terms of running forwards, passing backwards and giving them different options they can do. Um, within touch rugby, one thing to kind of challenge them is that you could start playing end ball and when you, you say, OK, when I shout or when I blow my whistle, we're going to go into touch. So all of a sudden, you've got players... having to think all the time. So the players are going this way, they're playing end ball where they can pass in any direction, you blow your whistle and now that team's attacking this way and they can only pass backwards and they have to score a try. So it's really engaging and it's very difficult to do because you'll have players, if they're attacking this way, you'll have sort of your A's all over the place and then you're saying, well, A's are going here. So this player might have the ball, you blow your whistle, to signal that you're going from end ball into touch. And these players have to work really hard to get behind the ball carrier and support him or her. So we're encouraging them to realign, get behind the ball carrier and respond to what's happening in front of them. And ultimately, coming back to it, games are trying to create some kind of organized chaos. So we're actually letting them make mistakes you know, you won't get all the basic principles across, but what it will do is make them think and really have to work together so things like communication are also kind of encouraged within this. 
So when we play touch rugby, when you set it up, what you generally want to do, here we would be going that way. You want it to be a little bit wider than it is um, sort of lengthways. So when they, they are here, they've got more opportunities to score tries. So playing it this way and narrow, it would take them quite a while to work up the field because particularly at junior level, they're always passing backwards and not necessarily always running onto the ball. So to try and encourage them to run onto the ball, whenever you've got these games, you can say, you can only catch the ball if you're moving. If you're standing still and you catch the ball, the other team are going to get it. So we're trying to create real life situations. And we're trying to really emphasize the principles of play of go forward, which is one of the key principles. We go forwards and we contest possession. So we have the ball and we move forwards. And the next thing is we have support and we look at continuity and we look at pressure. So touch rugby, uh, again, it needs to be refereed pretty well for it to be effective. One thing that we can do um, is if a player is tackled here, so the defence has to, um, once they make the touch, they have to run back, touch their own try line before they come into the game. So if an attacker's running at me, I tackle him, I've got to run back, touch my try line and come back into the game. And the reason we do that is to then create space. So we overload the attack. So when we're playing touch rugby, it might be that you start off to get some success, you have eight V six. So eight attackers versus six defenders. So we start to score tries and we start to get it. Another thing, rather than defender going back, Defender makes the touch, they have to go and take a knee until the next phase has been played. So they have to stay on their knee, they make the touch, they stay on their knee, the attack passes the ball and they can't get up until the next player has been tackled. Again, we're just manipulating the defence and we're trying to condition it to what we want to do. So when a player is touched, generally they put the ball through their legs and then somebody comes in and acts as a scrum half and passes the ball. So there's lots of different variations. We can really, we can play touch to encourage the offload. So when you get touched, you must take three steps. So what we don't want players doing in contact is playing touch and then stopping because they're gonna stop when they go into contact. So again, it comes back to trying to replicate what we want them to do in the game in touch. So when you get touched, you must take three steps before you put the ball down or before you offload. So when you're offloading, can you offload within three steps? If yes, offload. If no, it can be ball through the legs or particularly with younger kids, you can teach them to put the ball on the ground and present the ball. So when you get touched, you just have to go to ground and present the ball. And again, there's different things you can look at. So if you're looking at ball presentation, it might be that you don't want the ball to touch the ground first, you want the body to touch the ground. So if they get touched and they kind of do this and go to ground, right, stop, the other team get the ball. When you're coaching, it's really good to have two balls. So all the time, I'm refereeing the game. We have, um, the players are playing with one ball, they're playing, somebody knocks it on. Okay, so the players have got that ball, somebody knocks it on. Okay, turnover, you're playing now. So we're really keeping the game going. There's nothing worse than the ball going off and somebody go and get the ball or give it back to them. We want to keep them engaged and we want to keep them challenged for the whole game. So other variations we can look at is that within the defensive line, you can put, say, two or three players in a pinny and those players cannot tackle, but they must be in that defensive line. So what that's trying to do is to get the attacking team to recognize where the space is. So they recognize where the space is initially, but they also have additional space where the players are with pinnies on and they can run straight through them. So the defensive line have to then compensate for the fact that the player next to me, well, he can't tackle. So we, myself and the player on the outside of him, have to look after him in the middle. So we have to compensate for his tackle. And we're trying to get the players to look up and see where the space is and exploit that in numbers. Play in touch, as long as you've got the right parameters and it's refereed, it can be successful. The last point, just on that, when you play in touch, I think it's always good at junior level to say 
The tackler, then everybody else has to come back two or three metres or up to five metres to allow the attack to have a bit more space and a bit more time to, to exploit in front of them. It's very difficult to play touch when people are right on the offside line, you know, just there and they don't have much time or space in front of them. So there's lots of different things you can do with touch. For instance, you can say you must make two passes before you get touched. When you get touched, you must offload. You can only score in the wider channels. You can manipulate the defence. You can play touch where the defender goes back once they've made the touch to their own try line. And you can play where once they've scored, they turn around and keep going. So if I'm on one team, so I'm here, we've scored here. OK, well, our team's now going this way. And if we score here, now we're going back this way. So it's really, and it works on their fitness as well. And just to finish, coming back to the principle of everyone on your team has to score. So if you've scored that first try, you can't score the next one. Or you can, but everybody else has to score by the end of that game. So can you see how the games progress? So the starting games, it's things like tag, it's things like tap and pass. It's various different games just to get them warmed up, just to get them engaged, and just to subtly introduce the skills and the concepts and the themes that you want to do that session. Then you break the session down and you look at a practice where, which is progressive. So you're challenging the players, but you're taking away the pressure effectively of defence or attack, depending on what you're working on. Then you, make, you give them an opportunity to practice it and refine the skills, and that's when the coach can give the feedback and kind of work and observe and really try and improve, you know, one or two key points that you've spoken about at the start or that may have come out through that first game that you played. Then you go back into the game for the last part of the session. So if you've got an hour session, I'd recommend that at least 50 to 60% of that is on games, if higher, if possible. And that was obviously dependent upon um, numbers and stuff as well. But generally, the kids are more engaged, they're more active, and they learn more through actually having a go and putting it in a real-life situation, playing a game.